Good, mo good morning, everyone, and welcome to this 18th edition of the ANED. Before we start, uh, in case some of uh, you wondered, uh, we'll uh, scan the QR code you received by mail at the end of the conference, so we know uh, you, were, you were there. Um, the topic of this conf conference is the uh, social and environmental impact of uh, international sports. Um, as for the timing, the conference is scheduled to last uh, 45 minutes with approximately half an hour of presentation and uh, 15 minutes of uh, question and answer. And uh, I will now hand over to our uh, conference. Thank you, Marine. Hi, good morning, everybody. So um, I'm really happy to be here today. A very long time ago, not very, very, but very long time ago, I was a student at TBS. It did not really change, except that we didn't have those uh, small chairs and stuff. So it's funny to go back 20 years later. Um, so this morning, we will have um, a session together on uh, international sports and their impact on uh, social and environmental the social and environmental impacts. Just uh, a quick intro to explain you my background and maybe why I was invited to come to deliver this uh, conference. A um, long time ago, I'm from Toulouse, I was in Ferma, in Terminal, S. Spemat, it was a delight. And then I did Prepa Chaussée and then I um, entered the PGE program of uh, TBS. As you know, what PG means, I say that, but outside of TBS, it doesn't mean anything. Um, then I studied two years at the Sorbonne University. I got a master's degree in finance, um, the year of the economic uh, crisis. And then I also got a BA in international English, still at Sorbonne University. Um, I lived in and worked in in Paris for 10 years. I was working in the movie industry and in the media industry and then I moved to London for six years and I worked in multiple at multiple tech companies, um, mainly managing relationships, direct relationship with relationships, sorry, with uh, Hollywood Studios, International Sports Federations and US sports organizations. NFL, NBA, UFC, and, and these guys. Um, I was working at companies created stream, creating streaming and video platforms. So if you know NBA Pass, NFL Pass, and if you have ever watched sports or movies or TV shows on your phone or your tablet or your laptop, I was working on the tech com for the tech companies that were creating and that had the technology to provide that service. So similar companies are Netflix and Amazon Prime, for example. So today um, we will talk about the impact of international sports. So as an introduction, my experience in sport is really international. Uh, now I run my company in Toulouse um, and I my last project was being part of the organization of the Rugby World Cup in Toulouse. Um, so we, if we have a look at um, the impacts of international sports, um, then these are mainly the, the very next or the very last major international sports events. So in terms of Olympics, you have Paris 2024, so this one, I hope, and I'm sure you heard about that before. And trust me, you will hear about that a lot until September 2024. Then you have Milano, Cortina d'Ampezzo 26, then LA 28, and Brisbane 2032. Yesterday, they have just announced that India has sent their application to host the Olympic Games, the summer ones in 2036. In terms of other non-Olympic major international sports events, you had the FIFA World Cup in Qatar in 2022. Then you now have the Rugby World Cup in France. You will have the next Super Bowl in, in Vegas um, and the next uh, Football World Cup 
in the US, Canada, and Mexico in 26. And the last logo that I chose, it is linked to um, the second Asian Games. So it's like Olympic Games, but for Asia. And that will um, happen in 2034 in Riyadh in Saudi. Actually, it will be in a city that has not been built yet on a mountain where you don't have snow. But still, we will talk about that later. So if we have a focus now on the Olympics. So the current Olympic Games and Paralympic Games, the way we know them, come from an ancient version that was called Pan-Hellenic Games. So Olympi on the map is there. Uh, but actually you had many other cities in ancient Greece that had their games. Um, if you like MMA and UFC, this is a picture of their ancestor, which was called Pancras. Um, UFC is like a kid's very cute and very sweet sport. Their version in ancient Greece, you had just two things that were forbidden. You could not uh, remove the, the nails from the fingers. And the second step that you were not allowed it was to take the eyes out of the face of your, your opponent. Any anything else was authorized. And as you may understand, then some of them were dying after, after the fight. Um, the, the games were lasting five days. Day three was some sort of a giant day when they were eating like crazy. And the, the, the Panhellenic Games, then they were all dedicated to Greek gods, which is a component that completely disappeared with the modern version. So now... We so this man is Baron Pierre de Coubertin. He he was a French arist aristocrat who loved ancient Greek and Latin culture, um, and he was also educated at British boarding schools, uh, where sports was really encouraged. And then while studied studying sorry ancient Greek, he found out that at those times they had really big sports competitions and actually the ancient Olympic Games, they were happening every four years for 1,000 years. So he decided to, to renew and to revive the Olympic Games and this is why he created the modern Olympic Games. So in terms of um, dates, he created the International Olympic Committee at a conference at the Sorbonne University. So you just have you have one picture. It's quite really funny. They all have their big hats and their small mustache. Um, and it was in 1894. Um, and the first modern Olympic Games were in Athens in Greece in 1896. Um, that version of Olympic Games, you roughly had 150 people maximum, only men, and with a very limited number of sports. If you have a look at this map, so I won't go into really dive deep into details, but modern Olymp Olympic Games, if we have a look at where they have happened so far, many most of them have held in Europe and North America, never in Africa, never in the Middle East, just once in South America, in Rio de Janeiro in 2016, twice in Australia, and when we have a look at Asia, only in China and in Japan. So this is why having India apply, applying now to host the Olympic Games, this is why it's so important. If you hear about the International Olympic Committee, you can have a look at anything, but this chart is the most important one. If you understand this one, you understand their strategy, what it, it was, 
what it is and what it will be until maybe this changes. So when you have a look at their revenue streams, 73% of the money that comes in comes from broadcasting rights, so TV rights. It's really good. It's really good until the TV rights value falls. Fall. So until now, they have always risen. And this is good to them. But then the problem is that this creates a big dependency around the TV rights. This is the same for FIFA, for example. If now we are in in an environment where TV rights just go up and up and up. This is the same for football, for example. The problem is that if something happens, for example, COVID, that takes the TV rights out for one year, then it meant that in 2020, because the Tokyo Olympic Games did not happen, virtually 73% of the money that was coming in for them had not was not able to come in so this is why it was so important to them to move the Tokyo Olympic Games to 2021 when you have a look at these figures 18 percent of the money they make comes from their top program basically the sponsoring they don't say the word the word sponsoring they talk about partnerships this is exactly the same this is just a different word 18% of the money they make comes from sponsoring deals. So the IOC, they directly sign themselves with people like Coca-Cola, Alibaba, Airbnb, Procter & Gamble, Toyota, uh, Visa, Allianz, and they sign for 10 years. And after that, they renew the contracts. So for example, Omega, who do the timekeeping, then they have signed the contract. They started their partnership in 1932, and afterwards, every 10 years, they renew the contract. It's not automatic, but then if you renew a contract as a top, part, top program partner, then the contract lasts for 10 years. So these companies, they work on multiple Olympics. They work for example, you will you will have um, Coca Cola being a partner for Paris 2024. They will be for Milano. They will be for LA. They were for Beijing in 2022, and they were for Tokyo and for the previous ones. Um, in terms of sponsoring, it means that the organizing committees of Olympic Games in every single city they cannot sign a sponsoring deal with these companies, and that the money that is given by these companies to the IOC is not given to the organizing committee, even if these companies work on their games. Um, very briefly, the last other revenue streams, other revenues, meaning merchandising, and 4% other digital revenues. This is um, OTT and um, everything which is, which is digital. When you have a look at how they use their money, 90% of the money they make, which is equal to $5 billion, is directly re-injected re to um, the organizing organization of the games. So they give money to the organizing committee committees, and they also have programs to help the athletes. 10% of their revenue is used for their own um, operational operations. 10% of what they make is $500,000. Half a billion, they need half a billion to work as a company. This is huge. This, there are many people, but still this is huge. So if you understand, having a look at this figure, that they really, really, really depend on the TV rights, you can understand the whole strategy of the IOC afterwards. If you understand that the money that they make, they give most, most of it to organizing committees and athlete programs, then you understand how they work. Everything else you hear about them comes from this. So if we go a little bit further, 
the red cycle in the middle, I will not detail this one, but the red cycle in, in the middle is the organizing committee of every single edition of the Olympic Games. So you see there that they do not work alone. They have multiple institutional partners. They work with uh, the IOC, the National Olympic Committees, the National Sports Federation and the International sports federations. They work with WADA, which is the World Anti-Doping Agency, and they will work with the Court of uh, Arbitrary in Sports. Basically, you have a special uh, court. If you have, it's it's similar to Court de Cassation in France. If you have a big case that you need an ultimate legal decision on, that goes to the CAS. Now, if we focus and have a look, at Paris 2024. So the Olympics will be from July 26 to August the, August the 15th, 2024. The, the opening ceremony will be on the Seine River and the Paralympics will happen from August 28th to September the 8th. It is the very first time that you have perfect equality between men and women athletes. Before that, that has never happened. And you will have the total number of athletes that can come to that can compete at Olympics and Paralympics, which is 10,500 athletes. You have 32 disciplines, and the organizing committee is called Paris 2024, which is a name that was, I guess, really efficient to choose. Their president is Tony Estangé, who is an Olympic champion in uh, kayak, and their CEO is Etienne Taubois. So Paris 2024, they invented and they introduced the concept of compact games. Um, this is something that also relates to the impact that they want to have. 95% of existi are existing or Temporaries, temporary sorry, infrastructures. So basically, existing infrastructure in an in, an existing infrastructure is, for example, reusing Stade de France and branding it for Paris 2024. A temporary one. It is really simple. You have tracks and tracks and tracks of boxes. The boxes arrives on the venue. They arrive on the venue. And they open the boxes, they assemble everything, the competition start. Afterwards, they dismantle everything and then they send the boxes back to other championships. Basically, for the Olympic Games in Paris, they do not build anything. They just decided to build a new swimming, a new swimming arena in Saint-Denis and the Olympic Village also in Saint-Denis and every the two of them will be reused afterwards to have a proper and good swimming pool for kids from saint saint to come and to learn how to swim. You have 30 disciplines in less than 10 kilometers away from the Olympic Village, and you have 85% of athletes with, who will be based, sorry, less than 30 minutes from the place they will compete at. Okay, so I will try to show you. Wait, ah, pardon. Entrez dans le futur de la banque en ligne avec Revolut. Envie de A little bit of... Minute Pépillon. Aujourd'hui, je vais vous donner la deuxième... Ok.
Okay, so, sorry. So, so this was the, yep, um, yeah. So this was the first time they ever sent a short video to say that yes, we are Paris and yes, we are French and no, we don't do things just like everybody else in the world. And yes, we don't want to have opening ceremonies at a stadium, just like it's always been done. We want to have an opening ceremony on the river, which in the world of Olympics is like, I don't know, don't look up, but in a very positive way. It's like, wow, this is amazing. This is crazy. Only the French can do that. Um, this is very innovative. Um, and you also have a lot of preparation for that. The opening ceremony for the Paralympics will be on um, Place de la Concorde. And same for them. They do not want opening ceremonies inside stadiums. So in Paris this summer, you will not see usual opening ceremonies that last for five hours with one country after the other like showing their flags and like France and Spain and Argentina and ooh, hi mom hi dad this this will not be this way they will be on boats I can tell you that one of the most important position at Paris 2024 is this is related to the security of the bridges because you have certain bridges that they will need to go under but that will be something absolutely amazing and never, never, never seen previously. If we, have a, if we have a look at a few figures, so when you add audiences, you have 4 billion people who watch the Olympic Games. It is the most watched um, sports competition in the world. I know that super some of you might think yes, but Super Bowl is the most the famous uh competition in the world. Yes, but Super Bowl is just one game. And it's really American, which is good, but it's just once one. The Olympics, it's two weeks for the Olympics, one week break and then two weeks. So the scale is different. The sport is different, the scale is different. Um, you will have 6,000 accredited journalists, more than half a million meals served at the athletes' village every single day, 9.7 million spectators on site, 40 competition sites, and many, many, many hours of TV broadcast. If we have a look at the OCOG budget, so this one is also very important. So I would say that it's quite a balanced budget. The total budget of the OCOG, the organizing committee of the Olympic Games, is, is equal to 3.9 billion euros. In France, I don't know if you are all French, but in France, we have something absolutely amazing, which is called la Cour des Comptes. If I translate, it is the court of earls or comp no, of like uh, countings. And basically these people, they, their job is to audit really regularly every single public project that costs a lot of money. So at the very beginning, when Paris was chosen for the Olympics for 2024, they started to say, oh, we have the Olympics. We want to build a new stadium. Uh, yes, that's cool. But uh, how much will it cost? Oh, it will be fine. Uh, well, no. No. So they decided to keep the stadiums that we have in Paris. Then they wanted to build new roads, new infrastructures. Yes, but how do you budget it? Yeah, but it will be fine. We will find money. Uh, no. So... This organization is tracking every single euros that is being used by Paris, by Paris 2024. Their budget is stable, I would say. One third, which is equal to 1.21 1. billion euros, 
comes from the, comp the contribution by the IOC. So when we had a look at the figures from the IOC, then the IOC out of the 5 billion a year, they give 1.21 1 billion to uh, Paris 2021. Then another third comes from ticketing. Ticketing, the sales of tickets, they need to bring 1.16 billion euros by the thanks to the sales of the tickets and hospitalities. So let's be very clear and very honest here. It unfortunately, contrary to what people might have dreamt about, it has never been the plan to have all tickets for all the competitions of the Olympic Games sold at 20 euros per ticket. Some of them are cheap, but the tickets for the final of athletics or the tickets for the opening ceremony, it has never been the plan, the plan to sell them at such a cheap price. Because if they want to have a balanced budget, the ticket sales need to bring 1.16 sorry billion euros and then the 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 rest 127 million euros coming from licenses and merchandising so this little um uh, the the pens everything which which is linked to the arrived products 100 million the black one 100 million coming from the French government, which is small here, but 100 million, that's not that bad. And the rest, 204 um, million from other revenues, like, uh, I don't know, digital revenues and stuff like that. So when you have a look at this budget, it's a very balanced budget. And it is being tracked both by the organization, by their auditors, and by Cour des Comptes. You have another company working on the Olympic Games. Their name is Solideo. And Solideo, their role is to build infrastructures for the Olympic Games. So their role is to build the swimming arena and the Olympic Village. They have a few small issues that I will talk about later. But still, they are also audited all the time. So this is a map of the Olympic venues. So in blue, you have Paris city center. On both sides, you have the woods around Paris. And so you see that uh, this compact games concept relates to having many, many, many competition venues close to the city center or the city. Same for the for the Paralympics. This will be how Pont d'Iena will look like. So everything is in red is for the games. Grand Palais will be extended and you will have the judo competitions there. In Place de la Concorde, you will have no cars anymore and you will have urban sports. So breakdance, BMX, climbing. Unfortunately, these sports will not be part of the edition in LA. This is the aquatic center, so the one that they will build in Saint-Denis. This is Stade de France. This is the temporary venue for beach volley on the Champ de Mars. And football and men and women um, games will be in different cities in France. So you will have other competitions outside Paris. So equestrian will be in Versailles, swimming and water polo in Nanterre, hockey, grass hockey uh, will be in Colombe, kayak and rowing will be in Vers-sur-Marne, and climbing will be at Le Bourget, in Le Bourget. On Bal in Lille, football in, in several French cities and sailing in Marseille. And to finish, surf will be in Tahiti. This will look like this for equestrian competitions. The gardens here are the real gardens of Versailles. This is the aquatic venue in Vers-sur-Marne, the pierre Mauroy Stadium in Lille for handball, and sailing will be in Marseille. This is how the Olympic Village will look like, and this is how the HQ in Saint-Denis looks like. 
you have 28 Olympic sports, so the usual one that you see, and you have four new ones, breaking, sports climbing, skateboarding, and surfing, and you have 22 Paralympic sports. These companies are the worldwide partners of the Olympic Games, so these people sign directly with the IOC. So these ones, you see them at every single edition, summer or winter, for the Olympic Games. Airbnb are the new guys. It's quite new. Um, these ones, and afterwards, are the partners that sign deals with Paris 2024 only. They have to bring $1 billion by signing deals with these companies and the other ones that I will show you. That can be financial sponsoring. That can also be also be sponsorship with products or services that are given, well, that are valued and valued and priced, but that are given to Paris 2024. For example, Orange, they will buy, they will bring the 5G, EDF, the electricity. Decathlon here will um, will will give all the clothes and the shoes and everything for the 45,000 volunteers. And basically, these are the ones that give, well, the ones that are the tier one, tier one partners, the most important ones in France. These ones are tier two, and these ones are tier three. Uh, for example, Renchat, they will um, work on the, most of the contracts for people who will want to work on the Olympic Games, not at the organizing committee, but people who will work at, um, I don't know, the restaurants or for the organization and everything. Ronstadt is managing the contracts. So now that we had a look at Paris 20, 2024 in terms of organization, and now that we had a look at how they are, are managed. Now we need to have a look at the impact of these games. So the first part will be on the impact that they communicate on and what they want to do and what they are doing. How do you, de do you define impact in sports? So you have different components. You can have an impact that is social, environmental, environmental, um, the image impact, financial, political, diplomatic, local versus global, and everything which we call heritage. Where do the emissions of sports events come from? This is for every single sports event. This is exactly the same for a UFC game, an NBA game, for the Super Bowl final, for your local football club. This is the same for TFC, Stade Toulouse, it's the same. So emissions come from, come, come from transportation, food, facilities and infrastructure, air conditioning and heating, digital broadcast and broadcast with all the servers that you need to use to broadcast and to keep the data and merchandising. Just uh, now that we are talking about aircon, in order to keep their uh, emissions low, it is not in the plan to have air conditioning anywhere for any competitions at Paris for Paris 2024. The, so now we really need to hope that it won't be 45 degrees outside, because even if they hope that the temperature will be 7 degrees less inside, 45 minus 7 is still 38. So this is one of the big potential problems that they will need to face. In terms of sustainability, Paris 2024, they want to have a big heritage and legacy for these games. So their plan is to have the carbon footprint of the games. It's the very first time, very first e sports event in the world that will be the first climate positive international event. They will do that by carbon compensation. 
and they have a special committee that is in charge of tracking that. Paris 2024, they have signed the Sports for Climate Action initiatives launched by the UN FCCC, so the UN, and they have signed the charter of um, 15 eco-responsible commitments written by the French Ministry of Sport and uh, WWF. Their goal is to um, show the example for fut future international sports events to really try to do something really big in terms of sustainability. Uh, I will not lie, in sports you have lots of greenwashing um, talks, but then in that case, Paris 2024, they actually act. <laughs> they, of course, use uh, reuse a lot of competition venues, um, and they have temporary uh, venues too. They use the concept of a sobriety strategy. I don't believe that in any other sector the word sober or sobriety has really a positive meaning but in terms of sports event in that case it works really well and um, they really focus the facts uh, on the fact that people will use public transportation and they have announced that 100 percent of the energy that will be used will be renewable for the games they have a very sophisticated method to calculate and to track the carbon footprint, and they created a carbon footprint budget. And basically, they will track their carbon em emissions before, after, before, during, and after the games. Not just during, they use all the preparation in this calculation and everything that will happen afterwards which is quite new in sports. They have a tracking method around the anticipation, avoidance, reduction of setting and mobilization of um, everybody. For Paris 2024, they want to gather people around the games and especially French people. So they have a program which is called Generation 2024 and they want to involve young people around the Olympics. There is a big focus on, bless you, a big focus on uh, sports at school, the week of sports, uh, the week of the Olympics at school, uh, the, program, the program to encourage young people to do physical activity, not only sports. So if you want to go out and walk for 30 minutes, this is part of the program so that people they just move move their body more you also have what we call terre de jeu accreditation so many cities outside paris they can organize um, events and competitions that are um, that match the criteria of the olympic games organization this is how paris 2024 managed their, their impact and this is what they will do but then, well, especially to your generation, I will not um, I will not hide that we are in a current climate crisis. And the question is, how do we solve that equation? So if you have a look at the IPCC report, IPCC in French is GIEC. This is what needs to be done. This is the simplified version. So in order to keep global warming under 1.5 degrees, we now must, one, stop consuming coal, reducing but 95%. So when I deliver conferences in France, they say, oh, but that's fine, we don't, that's fine, we don't have coal. Yes, but everything that we buy is made in China or in Asia, and they use coal as a primary source of energy. So indirectly, we use coal. So how do we help those countries transi transition out of coal? This is the main question. This is not about saying, oh, oh, China, they should do something different. Okay, but maybe they could say, okay, so if you're not happy, you just have to produce your products at home. 
these are the types of discussions that are now happen happening in terms of global warming. Because I think it's quite easy to always reject the problem and the fault on the others. Point number two, we need like collectively in the world, reduce our oil consumption by 60%, and we need to reduce our gas consumption by 70% globally. So we could see that Paris 2024 is the most advanced international sports events now in terms of sustainability. If you, if you have a new look at other sports events, Qatar, I love Qatar, I have nothing against them, but you have to understand that 20 years ago, when somebody came in a meeting room at FIFA and that person said, we have the solution, we can host the, the Football World Cup and we will have air conditioning everywhere at the stadium, people applauded. For them, with their system values, it was amazing because they had found a solution. Now, 20 years later, 21 years, years later, this was more than less acceptable for many, many people in terms of impact. But 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it was not making any problem. Now we see the impact and we see the consequences, but back then, they, they did not have any problem. Um, Rugby World Cup in France, it's quite fine. The Super Bowl, that's okay, except that the transportation emissions to go to the Super Bowl are completely crazy. The next Football World Cup will be in between three countries. So I can tell you that if you want to go from Mexico to Canada, you for, for now, if you want to arrive before, uh, if you want to have a journey that lasts less than five days, you just have to fly. So how do you work? How can you work around the impact and sustainability of this event, which was given to these three countries quite a long time ago? How do you manage that with the current situation we are living it in and also the, the current awareness of the population? Um, and of course, Riyadh 2034, they got the Winter Asian Games, they got uh, them attributed, but for a city that has not been built yet, in a place which is high in the mountains, but where they do not have any snow and they will never have any snow. So in terms of impact, it's quite questionable, let's say, like this. You might have heard about Saudi Arabia and Qatar having a big competition in terms of sports. They announced that they had the Asian Games the week before the the opening ceremony of the Football World Cup in Qatar. And when we had the Football World Cup in Qatar, Saudi Arabia decided to buy as many TV ads as possible. So you, when you were watching the games, you had the game, then you had like the sponsored videos, then you have that Qatar Football Rugby World Cup logo. And afterwards, all the time, you had at least one advertising for Visit Saudi. This is not just a coincidence. This is just that in terms of soft power, there's a big competition between these, these countries. What are the risks the risk around Paris 2024? So number one, readiness. I will not lie to you, readiness is a big problem for any single organizing committee. Inflation, unfortunately, these games will cost at least 15%, 15, 15, percent more because of inflation. Security, currently in France, security, especially for sports events, is focused on terrorist attacks, um, security of people, security of building. The problem here is that you have another security component which is linked to heat waves. What, what if 
it is 45 degrees outside when the athletes need to run the marathon between Versailles and Paris. What will happen? What will happen to the audience? Well, we, what will happen to the athletes? Um, security is also linked to cyber security. What, what happens if they get hacked? In South Korea, they got hacked with a malware that was they ke that came in their system seven years, well, six years and a half before the beginning of the Olympics, and that was programmed to just destroy the system six years afterwards. It never happened because an intern, actually, a young person part of the team who had just been hired, he had kept a copy of the system on a um, hardware disk. This is the only reason. So they reloaded one version of the system that been affected seven and created seven years before. This is why the system didn't go completely down in 2018 in South Korea. You also have risk related to diplomatic issues. I will not lie to you that a big decision and a big speech will need to be delivered by our president and with a clear reply to the, the question, can Russian and Belarusian athletes compete in Paris, number one? And number two, if they compete, will they be able to, complete, to compete under their national flags? This is the biggest question that you have now. Knowing that in Russia, sports is a big tool to spread, I will quote, the amazingness of the Russian superiority of the holy Russia population. So they, of course, nobody is talking about that. You do not have lots of comments about Ukrainians coming to the Olympic Games or Russians or Belarusians, but I can tell you that in behind the scenes that you have lots of discussions. And of course, you have heat waves and sanitary, which is linked to the COVID. I know that you know that as well as me. In terms of risk management, at the Olympics, um, the risk have always been managed afterwards when a problem happened and not proactively. So debates and issues around Paris 2024, and this is the last, the last one. Number one, you have old shared gardens that were destroyed in Saint-Denis to build infrastructure. Number two, there will be students living at um, student housing, the Cruz one, who will need to leave the facility, the, the, their flats at the beginning of June 2024 so that delegations can sleep there. Homeless people in Paris will be gathered and sent outside Paris area, area and they will mainly be sent in to Brittany. You will have seven additional pe million people using Paris tubes. So I guess everybody has been in Châtelet, Les Halles, in Paris. Please imagine seven million people, more than what you have seen in your life in, in the tube of Paris. Inflation made the games more expensive by 15%. And unfortunately, you have several police investigations now, one around a suspicion of corruption and market attribution to event management and event organization agencies, and one which has been a big case because Solideo, the company building infrastructures, they hired undocumented people paying them really low money, not giving them any contracts, making them working like crazy on the Olympic Games infrastructures. And these, some of these people, they won the court trial and they now have their French paper, the legal ones. And last point, unfortunately, I know not many people have communicated on that, but Summer festivals in July and in August will be cancelled because they need security agents to work at the games. So to finish, 
an open question. Even when they are compensated, are the impacts of international sports events acceptable in the current climate crisis world? And just to let you know, these are things that are known but not communicated by the organizing committee. Thank you. Do you have any questions? No questions? Okay, which one of these points is the most shocking one for you? Solideo, yeah. Students, yeah, this is true. This is really shocking, but this is true. I'm not really sure they have a plan to give them new housing instead of this one. The only one that they can't do anything against is the inflation. The inflation, if it costs more, then they might have budgeted, but now they have to pay more. This is the only one they have to adapt. Any questions? No? No. Okay. So just to finish, if you want, so there are a lot of jobs open for the Olympic Games. Like when I say a lot, it's more than 6,000 jobs. So if you want to work for the Olympic Games or if you want to be part of it, have a look at it and you can find internships, you can work for that. So yeah, this is the last one. And they need people like you who know how to work, basically. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day.